vor zwei Wochen haben wir diese Veranstaltung angekündigt, ziemlich genau vor zwei Wochen. Und es war uns schon klar, ja, das wird äh, ein bisschen Wellen schlagen. Aber das Ausmaß, wie es jetzt war, haben wir uns nicht äh, träumen lassen. Ähm, die Hauptfrage, die uns immer wieder gestellt wurde, was sagt dieser oder jener dazu? Ähm, meine Damen und Herren, an der Stelle ganz unmissverständlich. Wir sind eine unabhängige Jugendorganisation und wir laden hier zu einer Bildungsveranstaltung ein. Und damit kommen wir unserem Auftrag nach. Nicht mehr und nicht weniger. Wir sind insbesondere keine Partei, deswegen dürfen auch leider keine begünstigten Spenden entgegennehmen, aber das soll sie nicht hindern am Spenden. Jetzt vielen Dank dafür schon. Ne? Ähm, weil wir keine Partei sind, treten wir nicht zu Wahlen an und wir führen keine Koalitionsgespräche. Das heute Abend ist auch kein Koalitionsgespräch. Der Mann, der heute Abend unser Ehrengast ist, ich will es jetzt wirklich nicht länger auf die Folter spannen, ist ein europapolitisches Schwergewicht. Seit 1999 sitzt er im Europäischen Parlament und äh, man kann nicht behaupten, er habe das getan, nur um sich Freunde zu machen. <lacht> Es werden im Europäischen Parlament mehrere Dutzend Sprachen gesprochen, aber seine versteht jeder, auch ohne Übersetzer. Seine äh, Wortmeldungen sind berühmt und gefürchtet, insbesondere bei den hohen Repräsentanten der EU. Mit Herrn von Rumpoy verbindet ihn eine besonders innige Freundschaft. Denn er hat immerhin mal das Charisma eines feuchten Lappens. Auch der ewige Provinzbürgermeister aus Würselen, Martin Schulz, ist in einer besonders inniger Freundschaft verbunden. Meine Damen und Herren, Nigel Farage hat das Euro-Debakel schon kommen sehen, als man hierzulande noch von einem Erfolgsmodell sprach. Er hat mit seiner UKIP nicht vor Hohn und Spott der Etablierten äh, zurückgeschreckt und hat weitergemacht. Mittlerweile schickt sich UKIP an, eine der stärksten Parteien in Großbritannien zu werden. Die üblichen Vorwürfe, die auch wir hin und wieder hören, Provinzialität, Engstirnigkeit, Xenophobie, Straf der Lügen. Er bezeichnet sich als Libertären, weil er die Freiheit liebt. Und er hat schon früh erkannt, dass es diese Freiheit mit dieser EU nicht geben wird. Er hat im Ausland gelebt, innereuropäisch, außereuropäisch, hat an einem internationalen Finanzplatz gearbeitet, ja, er hat gearbeitet, auch das ist nicht selbstverständlich im europäischen Parlament. Und, meine Damen und Herren, seine Frau ist eine Deutsche. Er weiß also, wie es ist, unter einem Dach zu leben, das von einer deutschen Frau beherrscht wird. Meine Damen und Herren, begrüßen Sie mit mir den Mann, für den das Wort Euroskeptiker erfunden wurde. Nigel Farage. chamber in Strasbourg <laughs> and whilst it's true I do generate quite a lot of noise it's very rarely applause so thank you <laughs> and I want to thank Young Alternative for inviting me to come and speak here in Cologne this evening the last time I came to Germany 
uh, and spoke, I spoke in Berlin uh, three years ago uh, to a group of concerned uh, Eurosceptics, people worried about what the Eurozone project was doing uh, to this country and indeed to the rest of Europe. Um, and I said I would not come back uh, to speak in Germany until, no, 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 I would not come back to speak in Germany until there was a properly established political movement in this country offering the election. <laughs> something of a veteran at this game, because my conversion to Euroscepticism happened back in 1990. October 1990, and the British Chancellor of the Exchequer joined Sterling up to something called the Exchange Rate Mechanism. It meant effectively we pegged Sterling against the Deutschmark, and we did it at a time when Germany was doing relatively well, and Britain was doing relatively badly. And I knew on that evening that this simply wouldn't work. Now the reason I knew that was because unlike most people in Western politics these days, and we have a House of Commons full of them, they all go to the same school, they all go to the same Oxford College, they all study philosophy, <laughs> itself is not a bad thing, but they then all go into Parliament as researchers and become MPs aged 27 or 28, and none of them has ever done a proper job, a proper day's work in their And by contrast, by contrast, you know, I spent 20 years working in the commodities business in London, trading, buying and selling copper, aluminium, and doing business with German companies, and doing business all over the world. Um, and I knew that an economic and monetary union, stage two, and of course the Euro was stage three, I knew that the British and German economies were different things, that our economy uh, very much more service orientated, and the German economy very much more manufacturing orientated, and that our economies operated at different times and stages of the economic cycle. And within two years, we had interest rates at exactly double what they should have been, an extra million people unemployed in Britain, we had record house repossessions, record business bankruptcies in 1992, and I thought back then that the whole project of economic and monetary union, and behind that, the whole political project of attempting to take all these different countries in Europe with their different languages, cultures, histories, wines, cheeses, <laughs> the... I'm not so keen on the cheese, but anyway. The... And the attempt to take all of these different groups of people and to force them into a new European state without ever asking people whether that's what they wanted, I knew from that moment on that this European project was in the hands of very, very dangerous, fundamentally undemocratic people, and I have been a opponent, now a firm opponent, of this project for 20 years. there were some who tried to characterise uh, and paint me out to be anti-European. But that was never the, never the truth at all. I love Europe, and we should all love Europe. It is the most amazing, diverse, and fascinating continent on the planet of the Earth. In fact, if you love the diversity that exists in Europe, uh, that I hope, like me, you think that star-spangled banner, which they have as a flag, uh, the adoption um, of a very nice piece of music, 
uh, from Beethoven, but to be turned into an anthem, and the appointment of that fella from Belgium as the president. <laughs> I hope, like me, that you would agree that actually all of those things have got nothing to do with Europe at all. the word Europe and decided that they, in the Brussels institutions, are what Europe now is. That they, with their flag and their anthem, and their totally ridiculous president from Belgium, <laughs> by the way, I think he owes me big time. <laughs> You see, when this little fella turned up and gave uh, what was without doubt one of the dullest speeches I've heard in my entire life, the level of knowledge of Herman Van Rompuy across the whole of Europe was 2%. And after I told him his fortune, it went up to 4%. So I've been a good thing up there. UKIP was written off um, in the United Kingdom and elsewhere that somehow we were mad, bad, dangerous people and we went through a period of time and this will be familiar to all the new Eurosceptic group, some UKIP banners in the audience. Well done fellas, I love it. <laughs> and as every new country adopts a Eurosceptic party, as I'm delighted to say has now happened here in Germany, all of us face the same challenges. We face a media that would rather just blank us out. Or a media, or a media that when they do, when they do cover us, you know, make life very difficult indeed for us. And actually, if you think about it, you know, when you challenge a status quo, whether it's in politics, or in science, or in business, all through the history of mankind, if you challenge an established, comfortable status quo, they will always throw terms of abuse at you. And the more abuse that gets thrown at the AFD between now and May the 25th by the established media in Germany, the better, because it means you're making progress. <laughs> sense that there is a new Eurosceptic wind that is blowing through Europe, and in particular through the north of Europe. And I think we should examine for a moment just exactly why this has happened. I don't think anybody in this room or elsewhere would disagree that post-1945 it clearly made sense for France and Germany to be friendlier with each other and to trade with each other. Because one of the best ways of stopping people going into conflict is if they do business with each other. And so the idea was sold to the original founding countries that there would be a common market. A market where we trade. A market where we cooperate. A market where there would not be barriers of tariffs or, or excessive bureaucratic difficulties in trading with each other. And it was a vision that my country, albeit later and slightly reluctantly, but it was a vision that my country went for too. And indeed, you know, both my parents, when we had the referendum in 1975, both my parents voted yes for Britain to be in a common trading market with our next door neighbours in Europe. Now all of that looked and sounded fine. The difficulty was that actually, right from the very start, right from the first writings of Jean Monnet on this project, though never ever declared to the citizens of France or Germany or the latter-day members such as ourselves, <clears throat> from the very start, what actually happened here was that trade and cooperation was used as a cover 
for what was designed to be from day one, an attempt to build a new United States of Europe. That is what this project was about from day one, and they never, ever told us the truth about it. <laughs> but it was actually rather worse than that. It was rather worse than that, because the method by which they chose to build this United States of Europe was a method that from day one, it deliberately excluded democracy from the process. <laughs> excluded it from the process. <laughs> thinking was that democracy was damned inconvenient. That because of democracy, you have national elections. And once every four or five years, you can vote for a government that takes a completely different direction to the government of before. So in policy terms, a country can sort of tack all over the place. For, for, for the big thinkers like Monet, this was an inconvenience that wasn't to be tolerated because he was one of the great and the good and he knew far better what was good for ordinary people than they did themselves. <laughs> oh, it's true. And so they set up a form of government whereby the European Commission, which is the bureaucracy of the institution, the European Commission, the bureaucracy, within which there is not a single elected person and over whom there is no method of accountability. They were the body from day one and they're still the body today that have the sole right to propose legislation and the sole right to repeal legislation. And what that means for you as voters in Germany or for us as voters in the UK is that you cannot at a general election and you cannot at a European election vote for a government that will undo legislation that you see to be damaging and put in place something else. It has gone beyond the democratic fingertips of ordinary folk to actually determine their own destiny. It is the death of democracy and I think that the one thing we should really learn from history is not that in Europe, if we have nation states, will they go to war with each other. I think the lesson from history is that if European nation states are democratic nation states, we will never go to war with each other. And that is the most think back exactly a hundred years to realize why what we did with the Balkans was a disaster. Yeah. You know at Versailles and afterwards in the Treaty of Paris we got together and we said we can't have all these little independent Balkan states constantly rowing and fighting with each other, shooting an archduke and goodness knows what else. We can't have this. We can't tolerate this. What we're going to do is we're going to take all those different countries, we're going to give them one flag, one anthem, one currency, one president, one army, one police force, and we will call it Yugoslavia. And because we do that, there'll be peace in the Balkans forever, and just look what happened. And what we are doing now... doing now is we are building a European political project that has all of those symbols, that now even has an active foreign policy. You know, you'll notice that the British, French and Italians got together to bomb Libya to get rid of Gaddafi, and that now Libya is in a far worse state than it was before. You might have noticed, you might have noticed... might have noticed that in the Ukraine that we have been telling the Ukrainians and the British are more guilty of this than anybody but the EU has been telling the Ukrainians for 10 years that they can join the European Union and they can join NATO too offering a completely false set of hopes to those Catholic Western Ukrainians who were pushed to a state where they actually toppled 
their democratically elected leader. And if you poke the Russian bear with a stick, don't be surprised when he decides to bite back. <laughs> I don't want to be part of a militarised political Europe with a foreign policy. Far from it being a, a, a something that will be good for peace, I think it may well pose an enormous threat as it seeks to increase its size and its muscle. You know, Mr Barroso, another one of my great mates <laughs> over there, and it is a, it is a delicious Eurosceptic irony that for the last five years I've had seat number 20 on the front row in Strasbourg, in the chamber, and just a couple of feet away, in seat number 21, is Mr. Barroso. It's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> but even Mr. Barroso said three years ago, what we are doing in the European Union is we are building the first ever non-imperial, non-military empire. They want to build an empire, folks. <laughs> and what does history tell us? Yeah. What does history tell us about organisations that want to expand and build empires? It ends badly. This is not a project. This is not a project for peace and reconciliation. It may have been sold to us as that to begin with. Actually, the truth of it is, and I see it, I see it in the European Parliament when they play that anthem. I see the Euro-Federalists standing, absolutely ramrod straight to attention. <laughs> What we are actually now facing, what we are actually now facing, we're not the nationalists. Those of us that want to live in nation states, those of us that want to live in democracy, those that want to be able to determine our future and our children's future, we're not the nationalists. They are the nationalists in their desperate <laughs> But they have made two fatal errors. They have made two disastrous fatal errors. And the first is actually part of that whole imperial idea. It is enlargement. You see, when, uh, when the European community was Germany and the Netherlands and France and us and Denmark, and we had the ability to trade freely, goods, capital and services could move around freely, and also people could move around freely. But that never posed a threat to us, because actually the living standards in those countries were roughly similar. The incomes were roughly similar. The education systems, roughly similar. The health systems, roughly similar. But when we let in, in 2004, and onwards since then, groups of countries that, 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 that are frankly not fully recovered from the disaster of communism, what we did was to allow in very poor countries, and then even poorer countries too, still, with Romania and Bulgaria. And we said to these people, you can have total free movement within the European Union. Now, you haven't got to be Einstein to work out <laughs> that if you say to people in poor countries, they can move to rich countries with better education for their kids, with better health systems, and within the case of Romania and Britain, a minimum wage that is nine times the size, you haven't got to be very clever to work out that there would be a very big migratory wave. And I, I see what is happening in the United Kingdom, and bear in mind that we are probably the most liberal country in the whole of Europe when it comes to immigration. Now, we've had successive waves of immigration since 1945, much of it from our old Commonwealth countries, um, and we've really achieved, I think we had achieved in Britain, a degree of integration that I think was enviable in many other European countries. But the scale, <clears throat> the scale of what is now happening uh, is that we now have 4,000 people a week. 4,000 people a week come from Southern and Eastern Europe and settle in our country. And the vast majority of them are very good young people that want to work hard. Well, that's great. But it's also the duty of a government to put the interests of its own people first. <laughs> and what open 
before mass immigration within the European Union has done to the United Kingdom, well, some argue that it's put up our gross domestic product. I question that. But even if it has put up our gross domestic product, there's more to life than a couple of pips on our gross domestic product. There is the cohesion of our societies and the opportunity for our young people to go out and get jobs in the workplace. That I think is very And so in the United Kingdom, and in Denmark, and in Sweden, and in Finland, and I see the debate beginning to, in parts of Germany here as well, we're beginning to actually rebel against our politicians because of what they've done to ordinary working communities and families. It doesn't affect the rich. In fact, the opposite. For the rich, it's terrific. Because it means cheaper nannies, cheaper chauffeurs, cheaper gardeners. In fact, for the rich in Britain, we're back to Downton Abbey. You know, they've all got domestic staff and that's lovely. Uh, but what it's meant for millions of ordinary working people is that their wages have gone down over the course of the last 10 years. We've had a doubling of youth unemployment. And making these arguments in the past has been very difficult. Because anybody that ever dared anywhere in Northern Europe to touch on the immigration question was always liable to have a very nasty label thrown at him or her. But I don't believe that's the case. And I think there is now an overwhelming groundswell of opinion, particularly in Northern Europe, given what I think in Southern Europe may well get worse. There is now a demand that says, actually, not only do we want our nation state back, not only do we want our democracy back, we want control of our borders back so that we can decide, in terms of quantity and quality, who comes to live, work and settle in our country. second truly enormous error that the European project has made is the one that you all know about. I say that because you're paying for it. It's called Economic and Monetary Union. And, you know, I worked in economics, I worked in markets, I worked in currencies, as I said earlier, for 20 years. The argument that there could be a single currency for Germany and the Benelux countries and perhaps parts of Scandinavia, in economic terms, that argument worked. But what never worked was for, for the south of Europe to link in the same economic and monetary union with countries like Germany, Finland, and, and, and the, the Netherlands. It was inevitable that this disaster would come. Um, and I have to say uh, that whilst uh, the Germans may be somewhat resentful, as are indeed the Dutch and the Finns, um, about the money you've had to pay so far to bail out those countries, I'm sorry to be the bearer of news, which is you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. The situation in Spain, the situation in Italy, in Greece, and in Portugal is desperate. Desperate. There are millions and millions of people being forced into the most astonishing poverty. And to think that it's happening in Europe in the 21st century just because their idiot politicians wanted to join a big project is, I think, a very sad. <laughs> Those countries are now experiencing deflation. It is a terrible economic malaise, recovery from which can take a very long time. I think in terms of the migration that we've seen from Southern and Eastern Europe to Northern Europe, I sense it's only just beginning. With youth unemployment rates now nearing 60% in Spain and Greece, what would you do as a young person? And we shouldn't blame those people for wanting to better their lives. Uh, but ultimately, there is going to be a rebellion against the euro in those countries. Someone's going to come along and say, look, we've got to cut our losses. We've got to default on our debts. We've got to get our own currencies back. We've got to have a devaluation and an attempt to trade our way back to profitability. I can't tell you 
whether that's going to take two years. I can't tell you whether it's going to take five years. But I can tell you that the euro will not hold together. consequences of that for Germany are very serious indeed. The money that you've committed to the bailouts, the very complicated target to system, but Germany faces a big crisis too when some of these countries finally have to go bust and that is why it is so, so important that you now have a political party in Germany called the AFD that you can vote for because it has within it some very brilliant people some economists, academics, and business people, because Germany is going to need a political voice to work out how you as a country are going to navigate those choppy waters when this euro finally ends. And I want to say uh, that I wish the party all the very best of luck. I have my fingers crossed for you in the general election. You didn't quite make it, and I was up at midnight thinking, come on. Um, but on May the 25th, you are going to do it. And I'm not interested in all the media questions I've been asked and, and, uh, and, and some of you guys have been asked, oh, which group are you going to join in the European Parliament? Who are you going to get into bed with, as it were? And, 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 and frankly, all of that's irrelevant and none of it should worry any of your heads at this stage. Those of you who want to see a, a, you know, an active voice in German politics that stands up for national democracy, that wants to turn the tide of this monstrous European bureaucracy and will have the courage to chart the future course for Germany. Don't worry what happens after May the 25th, just go out there and jolly well make sure you succeed on May the 25th. Thank you very much. Indeed. Die da wären die 
die Kommission, das EU-Parlament, der Europäische Rat, der Ministerrat, EuGH, EZB und der Europäische Rechnungshof. Könnten Sie sich vorstellen, dass wir wieder zu den Wurzeln der europäischen Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft, in der die europäischen Völker friedlich und im Wohlstand gelebt haben, zurückkehren? Well, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're, you're quite right. Um, it would be terribly exciting, wouldn't it? Um, dismantling the European Commission, I mean, I'll, I'll do it personally, I don't mind. Um, it will mean uh, quite a lot of overpaid bureaucrats will lose their jobs, I, I absolutely accept that. I mean, I mean, look, the World Trade Organization oversees global trade, and it does it with, a, with an administration staff of 500 people, and it sorts out its disputes without needing expensive court buildings, but with a simple appeals panel procedure, which is quicker and more efficient in many ways than most courts. I mean, look, we are going to need, long term, we're going to need a structure by which we can cooperate, trade, and, and, and agree sensible common minimum standards and all of those things. I personally don't accept, I, I will never accept that the government of Europe is the unelected European Commission, and therefore, in my mind, it has to go. It has to go. The, the, we ought to be looking. We ought to be looking and thinking about the Council of Europe, which was set up in the late 1940s, which has 47 members of it, all, all the people, nearly all the people in this local time zone are part of it. And there, there's a good opportunity for parliamentarians from national parliaments to get together with their counterparts and their neighbours to discuss areas upon which people could and should cooperate. So I am, if you like, a radical with this. I don't think we can reform this European Union. I don't think we can change this European Union. The opportunity to do that was there with the Constitution and they didn't take it. So I think we need a completely new kind of Europe that is not based on political union. And yes, questioner, that means some of these institutions have to go. Ich gebe die Frage mal an Herrn Verzell weiter, der hat ja gute Chancen auch bald äh, mitentscheiden zu können in der Sache. Ja, das ist äh, sehr bedauerlich, dass Herr Farage keine Option sieht, die Europäische Union zu reformieren. Deswegen sind wir heute Abend zusammengekommen, damit ich ihm das erkläre. Ich bin, ich bin, ganz, einer, bin ganz einer Meinung, äh, dass wir in der Tat massiv reformieren müssen. Ähm, die Kommission, so wie sie heute existiert, kann ich mir in zehn Jahren nicht vorstellen. Ich glaube, dass wir, dass wir da erheblich die Rechte äh, beschneiden müssen. Ich sehe das nur noch als ein Gremium zum Austausch äh, der europäischen Regierung. Dafür wird es sicherlich seinen Zweck erfüllen. Aber die wirklichen Entscheidungen, die müssen eben entweder da, wo es geht, auf nationaler Ebene getroffen werden oder da, wo europäische Entscheidungen getroffen werden müssen, die eben im Europäischen Parlament getroffen werden. Da wo Herr Farage und ich demnächst hoffentlich gemeinsam sitzen werden. Und das ist vielleicht auch der wesentliche Dissens, den die UKIP und die AfD haben, dass wir als eine Partei, die für Deutschland in das Europäische Parlament einziehen möchte, eben deutsche Interessen vertreten. Und ich glaube nicht, dass es aus deutscher Sicht wirklich praktikabel und sinnvoll ist, aus der Europäischen Union auszusteigen. Wir sind eben keine Insel im Nordatlantik, sondern wir sind ein zentraleuropäisches Land und es wäre ein politischer Amoklauf Deutschlands, wenn wir einseitig aus der Europäischen Union aussteigen würden. Yeah, I mean, actually, actually, you know, the truth of it is that just as those that support the European project have different ideas of what it should and shouldn't do, you know, there are lots of supporters of the EU who leave it as it is. Uh, you get leaders of a liberal group like Mr. Verhofstadt that wants an army, that wants to invade half the world. So they've got differences of, differences of opinion. And exactly the same is true of Euroscepticism. There are lots of differing shades of Euroscepticism, uh, differing national approaches to the... And you, you know, you're quite right. Our position is very different to your position. But I think the important thing is this, that what we're going to get in the next European Parliament is we're going to get 20 to 25% of the MEPs were there of a Eurosceptic persuasion. Um, and I think there are lots of things 
that we can work together on and we can vote together on, even if we see the end game slightly differently. The great thing is we're heading in the right direction. That's what we're doing. Well, if the Scots vote uh, to break away from the United Kingdom, I'd be sad about it. Um, it's a union that's worked pretty well. Uh, you know, it's not been perfect, but it's worked pretty well. What upsets me is that Alex Salmond has been allowed to get away with offering the Scottish people a referendum on independence when what he wants to do is cut the ties with Westminster but remain part of the European Union. And you cannot be an independent nation state and a member of the European Union. So, so what Salmon is offering is completely false and I hope it gets kicked into touch in September. <laughs> Ja, ich frage jetzt die andere Seite vom Panel nicht zu Schottland. Ich glaube, einverstanden. Ähm, Tanja. Ähm, was ist Ihre Position bezüglich der Ukraine-Krim-Krise? I, I think I've answered that, to be honest with you. I, 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 I think I said to you at some length uh, that the European Union has actually provoked um, an uprising and a movement that toppled a democratically elected leader um, and that has led Putin to react. And that doesn't mean I'm supporting Putin or not. I don't like what he's done at all, um, but I'm not surprised about it. And, and I, you know, I repeat, I think what we saw in Libya, what they tried to do in Syria, and what they provoked in the Ukraine shows me that an expansionist EU with an active foreign policy will not be a good thing for any of us. Herr Werner, Sie hatten, glaube ich, noch nichts zum Thema gesagt. Also, vielleicht... Hört man mich? Ja. Vielleicht... Ähm Schwierig für mich, gerade bei diesem Thema einzusteigen, weil natürlich die Ukraine ein ernsthaftes Problem ist. Wir wollen natürlich alle nicht die wieder äh, stärker werdende Ost-West-Auseinandersetzung und so weiter. Ich kann hier überblickungs-, überblickmäßig, ich könnte eine pro-russische Haltung einnehmen, ich kann genauso gut aber auch eine transatlantische Haltung einnehmen. Ich glaube, dass dieses Problem eigentlich zur Unzeit kommt. Man müsste dieses Problem äh, zur Seite legen, weil ich glaube, dass wir weltpolitisch, geostrategisch ganz andere Probleme haben als dieses wieder aufgebaute Ost-West-Auseinandersetzung. Alles klar, Tanja? Die nächste Frage. Für den Prozess der europäischen Integration wäre es ahistorisch, einen Wechsel der Vergemeinschaftung zu erreichen selbst in Zeiten schleppender Integration unter Dominanz der Regierungen. Wie sollte demnach aus dem Europäischen Parlament heraus, also ohne Mehrheiten in den nationalen Parlamenten, ein solcher Wechsel oder gar eine Auflösung der EU vonstatten gehen? Well, I mean, you're right to the extent that the, you know, virtually the, the, the entire political class, um, a number of the big banks, a number of the giant multinationals, um, decided a very long time ago that this was our future, European integration was the project, and nothing should be allowed to change it. Um, and uh, we now do have uh, these Eurosceptic parties growing across Europe, and that's a good thing. Uh, but it's going to take us an awfully long time to form majorities in national parliaments. I accept the premise of the question. Uh, I know in Germany this is different for historical reasons, but for the rest of us, the most likely way to get radical change in our relationships with the EU, and in turn for the EU itself to become something very different, is to force national referendums. That is the battle that we've got on our hands in Britain. <laughs> we're getting somewhere with it. In the past, our politicians, they keep promising, promising a referendum at election time. 
and then dropping the pledge. You know, Cameron five years ago gave a cast iron guarantee of a referendum, dropped it. Two years ago, Cameron was three line whipping his MPs to vote against the referendum. And then up shot UKIP. And suddenly, Mr. Cameron thinks we should have a referendum. <laughs> and, and one of my objectives in these European elections is to really try and hammer the Midlands and Northern English Labour vote to get the Labour Party into that position as well. So it is by these parties becoming big enough and forcing referendums on the issue that I believe will get the quickest change. I, I, I'm not knowledgeable enough on the German scene, but I think the word referendum perhaps has less good connotations here. Would that be a reasonable point or not? Also, so unterschiedlich unsere Ziele sein mögen beim Weg, den wir dort hineinschlagen möchten, sind wir uns schon mal einig. Wir möchten nämlich Volksabstimmungen als AfD. Und wir werden als AfD Was auch immer das Volk möchte, das werden wir zu akzeptieren haben als AfD. Und ich hoffe, dass die anderen Parteien in Deutschland und in Europa das dann genauso akzeptieren, wie wir als gute Demokraten das tun werden. Das will ja auch ganz gerne sagen. Natürlich ist es so, dass man die Situation der Briten und die Situation in Deutschland überhaupt nicht miteinander vergleichen kann. Deshalb, man kann mit einigem Recht natürlich einem britischen Politiker die Frage stellen, wie wird man das denn jetzt organisieren und strukturieren, dass man zum Beispiel aus der EU oder so austritt. Diese Frage, so weit sind wir noch überhaupt gar nicht, auch zu Recht noch nicht. Wir haben eine ganz andere Geschichte. Ich würde rückbezüglich oh, geschichtlich das schon sehen. Das, was... Ähm, äh, schon auch der Grund für den Ersten Weltkrieg möglicherweise gewesen ist, dass eben Deutschland in seiner hegemonialen Größe nicht ausreichend ist, als Hegemon durchzusetzen sich, aber als großer Nachbar natürlich ein bisschen eingefangen werden will von seinen Nachbarn. Das ist eine ganz, ganz andere äh, Annäherungsweise an die Problematik. Aber das, was ich vorhin in der Rede schon gesagt habe, bei uns beginnt ja erst die Debatte. Wir stellen uns ja gerade erst mal die Frage, läuft denn das alles richtig so demokratisch ab, wie wir die Demokratie in der Theorie mal kennengelernt haben, legislative, exekutive, judikative. So läuft es ja nicht ab. Und die Entscheidungsprozesse innerhalb der Demokratie laufen ja auch nicht so ab. Denn ich hatte ja vorher dargestellt, dass das Staatsvolk in immer größerem Maße eigentlich überrascht wird durch politische Entscheidungen, die durch äh, Referenten oder durch Zustimmung in, der, in den Wahlen gar nicht gedeckt ist. Wir haben jetzt vor vier Monaten eine Wahl gehabt, die eigentlich ganz klar eine konservative Wahl sein sollte. Letztlich aber regiert nun eine sozialdemokratische plus christdemokratische Koalition. Das ist nicht das, was die Mehrheit in Deutschland wollte. Sie sagen, Krieg in Europa kann dadurch verhindert werden, dass alle Staaten Europas Demokratien sind. Wie wollen Sie aber sicherstellen, dass alle europäischen Staaten Demokratien sind, wenn sie sie nicht unter ein Dach bringen, das EU heißt? Sind Dutzende europäischer Nationalstaaten insoweit nicht viel riskanter als eine vereinte EU? Let me put this to you. You cannot be an independent, self-governing, democratic nation and a member of the European Union. It's as simple as that, because, as simple as that because, because from the Treaty of Rome onwards, albeit buried in the small print, was the principle of the supremacy of law. So even if you vote in a government, in a national parliament, that wants to overturn a whole slew of EU directives, all that happens is, You go to the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, um, and it's ruled that what you've done is illegal under your treaty obligations. You can't have it both ways. So I, I, I go back to the question by saying, if you want nation-state democracy, fine, but you can't have that and membership of the European Union. It's as simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> Man kann nicht sagen, können wir sicherstellen, dass ohne die Europäische Union 
nicht demokratische Staaten dann möglicherweise nicht anfangen, Krieg miteinander zu führen. Man kann aber unter diesem Aspekt auch nicht hinnehmen, dass die demokratischen Grundrechte innerhalb der Europäischen Union verloren gehen. Europa hat seit nach 1945 demokratische Strukturen in äh, inzwischen fast allen Staaten ausgebildet und wir haben damit gute Erfahrungen gemacht. Bis zu dem Zeitpunkt, wo wir die demokratischen Strukturen in den souveränen europäischen Staaten durch die Europäische Union zurückgeführt haben. Und äh, die Möglichkeit eines EU-Superstaates, eines großen 500 Millionen europäischen Volkes, eines einheitlichen Staates. Also davor graut mir. Mir graut, mir graut vor einer Demokratie. Und eine Demokratie mit 500 Millionen Menschen ist ohnehin schon mal viel, viel größeren Problemen ausgesetzt, eine, als eine 80 Millionen Menschen Demokratie es auch schon ist. Je kleiner die Einheiten sind, desto demokratischer können sie funktionieren. Und desto Jetzt stellen Sie sich auch noch über 20 Sprachen vor. Und ähm, hier im Raum sitzen eine ganze Menge Leute, die haben keinen Kopfhörer auf. Der ein oder andere aber schon. Und äh, Herr Farage möchte sich vielleicht zur Wahl stellen und der Präsident eines Vereinigten Europa werden. Wie wollen Sie denn... Wie wollen Sie I tell you what, it's a lovely idea. It's a lovely idea, but you know what I'm going to choose? I'm going to choose Switzerland. That strikes me as being a very good one. Also, the the idea of a 500 and a 500 million Menschen Demokratie with over 20 Sprachen, die die behagt mir überhaupt nicht. Da wird mir ganz unwohl. Nein, nein, bitte nicht. Okay, dann ja, eine mehr Frage. Ähm, an Herrn Farage, wie bekämpfen Sie aktuell die Geldverschwendungssucht äh, der Europäischen Kommission? Und äh, dann weiter an Herrn Brezell, und wie werden Sie das ab Mai machen? Herr Farage beteiligt sich doch daran. Well, how do we fight the value-wasting practices? Um, uh, with a record of failure every single year. And it's worth pointing out. Uh, that the European uh, Union's accounts have not been signed off by the auditors for 18 years in a row. I mean, if these people were company directors, they'd all be in prison. Der Wahnsinn fängt ja schon bei einem einem Parlament mit 750 äh, Mitgliedern. Und das ist ja schon für sich genommen ziemlich irre. Das erinnert an den großen Sowjet, aber nicht an ein sinnvolles Parlament. Dieses 750 personen parlament hat dann auch noch zwei Standorte, einen in Brüssel, einen in Straßburg, beides schöne Städte, beide jeweils eine Reise wert. Aber dass da 750 Menschen mit Mitarbeitern ständig hin und her reisen, das ist überflüssig. Es gibt 40.000 bis 50.000 Beamte bei der Europäischen Union und mindestens noch mal so viele Lobbyisten. Aber ich habe gehört, die bringen Geld mit. Stimmt das? Okay, das war's mit den Fragen. Eine habe ich vermisst, die stelle ich jetzt einfach mal noch. Wie war die letzte Begegnung mit Martin Schulz? Ah, dear, dear, dear. Well, at least Elmer Brock smiles, I suppose. Um, Schulze, what can you say? He, he led the socialist group in the parliament for many, many years. And since 2004, I've been jointly leading a group as well. And it was really very funny because, you know, I'd be opposite him uh, in the chamber, not more than sort of 20 uh, meters away. Um, and, and when I was speaking, you could see him just being absolutely incensed with rage at what I was saying and always standing up and shouting and heckling and, and of course when I treat them like that they say I'm some sort of hooligan. <laughs> at 
when they do it to me, it's all right. Um, and, and a really nasty snarl. And I've been on a couple of trips. Uh, and there was one where we, I was actually in a minibus with Martin Schultz. And I think, you know, it was a tough call for him uh, whether to get on the bus or walk 60 kilometres. He wasn't sure <laughs> what to do. I, um, when I heard he was in the running to be president of the European Parliament, um, I, of course, supported that. And I wanted him as president of the Parliament. And after his inaugural speech, um, I said I was waiting, Mr Schultz, to see uh, when you took the chair which Martin Schultz we'd see. Whether we'd see the man with his colleagues being jovial and plotting the destruction of nation states, or whether we'd see the nasty, aggressive, snarling Mr. Schultz. <laughs> I was doing my best to really, you know, <laughs> try and wind him up. And, uh, and, and, and he didn't respond. And since he's been president of the European Parliament, there have been no altercations between Schultz and I, much as I've tried to engineer them. Um, and that, of course, is because his eyes are on a much bigger job. And he, of course, uh, now wants to replace Barroso as president of the European Commission. Uh, he's in with a chance. He's in with a chance of doing it, uh, particularly if the left-wing anti-austerity parties do very well um, on, on May the 25th. So just think of it. Martin Schulz could be the new face of Europe. And do you know something? Do you know something? Because I don't believe we can reform the current structures, I want him. Because I want him to become president of the commission, because he'll make all the Eurosceptic parties go up 10% of the polls. <laughs> gegründet, junge Alternative NRW. Da waren wir in einem Hostel. Heute haben wir eine etwas repräsentativere Location gewählt und bräuchten dementsprechend noch ein paar Euro Spenden. Jetzt werden gleich, wenn Sie rausgehen, wird jemand dastehen und wird das entgegennehmen. Ich wäre Ihnen sehr verbunden, wenn Sie die Taschen und Ihre Herzen öffnen. <lacht> Geräte alle wieder zurückzugeben, draußen bitte nicht vergessen. Ähm, außerdem werden draußen Unterschriften für eine sehr gute Sache gesammelt. Äh, jeder, der in der Stadt Köln gemeldet ist und da noch nicht unterschrieben hat, möge das bitte tun. Das war jetzt der letzte organisatorische Punkt. Ich bedanke mich ganz herzlich natürlich bei Herrn Farage für das Kommen. Er ist auch im Wahlkampf. Schönen Abend. Schön, dass Sie da waren. Vielen Dank.